So we're going to put this second tube back into the machine now and set it up and do a full range power test on it. In fitting these laser tubes the most unsatisfactory arrangement that I've come across is a way that you can fix this high voltage terminal to wires in the outside world. I've tried little things like that out of a terminal block. Uh, I'm petrified of over tightening the screw and breaking this terminal off because it's a, it's a brittle terminal. I happen to be lucky enough to have quite a few of these spare which are spring loaded pins for testing printed circuit boards. When you turn them around and look at the other end you can grind that end off. Look what's inside. Inside there we have a lovely little spring. It's a perfect fit for passing over that terminal. Okay so it comes on and off at the moment but that's easy enough to solve that problem. So what I'm going to do is to solder a wire into this end here and leave that spring open at the end there so that I can actually plug it on. Now this seven strand cable I've got here is probably a bit too thick to go in the uh, to go in the spring. It's taking virtually no current if you can remember only about 25 milliamps maximum. So what I'm going to do is take two of these strands off at the moment. So we need to leave probably about half the spring exposed. Now I'm going to tin this wire to start with because I've got half an idea that spring might be stainless steel and it might have a little bit of difficulty bonding to it but we'll give it a try. There we go the spring fits on there nicely. My guess is that even if that is stainless steel which I doubt it should still bond onto there. So we've got a wire with a springy end on it now. We need to do the same on the high voltage end. And there we go. Look, we've got a perfect little springy end on our cable now. This is some of the water pipe silicon tube. And I've cut a piece of that about an inch long, which I'm going to slip onto that cable first. So I've put slots in this top surface here so that I can adjust them backwards and forwards and line them up with the uh, with the, with the first mirror. Now what I'm going to do first of all is to connect up this cable on the end here. Now to make this connection here, gently squeeze the end of this spring just to squash it a little bit. It will now sit on there snugly and that is pretty secure. Look, you can see I'm pulling the spring a little bit and it's not coming off which means it's got a good contact on there. We'll just get our little piece of silicon tube and slip that over the outside there connect it down over the glass boss and when they supplied the machine it's called one uh, silicon adhesive sealer. Basically it's a, it's a horrible gunky silicon. This doesn't smell of acetic acid as it goes off. Acetic acid is the worst thing you could think of using because it's going to make cause corrosion inside here. But it is quite essential that you use this stuff because you need to stop any coronal possibility in this area because it is very high voltage and you don't want to let any damp air get to it. And it does run, squeeze some into this tube here and we can see that the tube is pretty well full down there and it will continue to run. You can see now that it's completely gone down and sealing around the, uh, around the glass. I really want to connect my water tube in so if I do that fairly quickly I can turn this over, connect my water tube in so I'm just going to squeeze the spring a little bit. There we go, look I'm able to tug that and it's not coming off. Temporarily I'm just going to plug that on there. Set the tube back almost as far as it will go. And we could really do with having this water outlet high up. High up means that any air that's in here will naturally go to this outlet port. And there we go, we've got our electrical connection. I need about probably inch and a half, two inches here. I've got plenty of room at the other end. Now this is a temperature probe which I use inside this little cavity here, this little box. Because during the winter months it gets very cold here in my workshop and the last thing I want is my tube to freeze. So I've set up a completely separate system that keeps an eye on the temperature in here and if it ever drops below 10 degrees C there's a couple of lamp bulbs just in the case below here which will turn on, heat up this enclosure primarily but it will also add heat to the inside of the machine so that they don't get dew forming in there and any rusty rails. At the same time I'm also checking the water temperature in the tank and when that drops 
it will automatically start pumping the water around the system independently without the machine being switched on. So I'm never going to have freezing water, he said, fingers crossed. <laughs> And there we go, it's sitting nicely in the airspace here. Now I know that when this tube is approximately lined up with the edge of the, sh the machine at the back here, it's pretty good alignment for the rest of the mirrors, because that's how I set it up originally. Well I've just put, put some of that, uh, that white silicon around this termination. I've just spread it around it, just to keep the moisture away from it. It doesn't need it for physical protection and we just slip that over it. So there we go, we haven't had to fill that up with, uh, with white gunk. Right, we'll just stand back for a second and have a think. Have we connected both the water pipes on? Yes, so I'm sure I've got water flow. Um, the HV terminal is connected and the cathode end is connected. We should be alright to go. Watch the water bubbles going through. And we make sure that the water bubbles all exit. They're all sitting on, if there's a small amount of bubbles sitting on this top edge of the tube, I'm not too worried about it because this is the cold side of the water jacket. There's only warm gases moving through this outside pocket here. Right, we're just going to pulse the machine to start with just to make sure that the tube is working. There we go. So the laser tube is working. That's the quickest and safest way to check it. And considering all the changes that I've done, had all the brackets off, put the tube back on, here's where the pulse is. It's already not very far off centre, but we don't need to worry about that at the moment. I shall leave the tube as it is. Now I've just come across an interesting phenomenon that you might like to see, um, because other people have mentioned this. I think it's a problem with the voltage striking. It get, gets into a, there's a transitional zone and it can't make up his mind whether it should settle down to a constant operating voltage or whether it should hover around the strike voltage. I'll turn the test on. You'll see that the current there is sitting up nearly at 6 milliamps. Then it drops to 5 and it drops right back to about 3.5. Okay, so now we'll go and look round at the back of the machine and watch what's happening to the laser beam itself. Now watch the two. There we go, see it? And there we go, there's a proper beam. It was having trouble striking. We look at the same phenomenon from a slightly different angle. You can see just at this end here, and then all of a sudden it starts to go into the middle, and then finally you get a nice level beam all the way along, a nice uniform beam. There it goes, look, there's a uniform beam all the way along now. Now we've just passed the 65% test, which would be where I normally run at, 20 milliamps. And this time I'm up to 70% and I'm experiencing this strange phenomenon. And again, it's this uncertainty as to which side, whether it's striking properly or not. Ah, here we go, there we go, it jumped. It jumped up to 21 milliamps from 15 there, right at the beginning. And now I'm going to run the program. Oh dear, the current, yeah, the current's gone up to about 20.2 or 3, so it's running at full power, 24.5 maximum. We're almost losing 15 watts through the mirrors, which is quite staggering. But then again, I haven't set anything up, and I haven't cleaned the mirrors just recently, so I shall have to go through that exercise. So I think we've just found out what the next video is going to be about. After initial reading up about how the laser worked, I anticipated that I would be able to demonstrate to you how this oxygen poisoning or the dissociation of oxygen from carbon dioxide to make it into carbon monoxide would affect the power. And so what I did, I ran my machine on this test program as you see here. It predict, takes 5 seconds to run a hole and then it takes 10 seconds to traverse between to the next hole. So every hole that you see here is actually 15 seconds. So I was trying to get a timeline um, so that you could see the change in the depth of cut that I was producing at 95% power. 
And very quickly, this was the result. So here we've got, well, there's certainly no change of power. And if anything, it's, it increases slightly as we go along here. But, but basically, it's fairly level. Um, and then we also carried on around the corner because this took about 13 or 14 minutes to run this test. And as you can see, round the corner here, we're no different. So we had a good steady power, varying very slightly, but basically a good steady power all the way through the test at 95%. And I had no hint of any degradation of power. Now that was a surprise to me at that point in time. But of course, as I read on further and discover more, I realise that we're not going to see oxygen poisoning over a short period of time. It's something that happens over a long period of time and is the cause of the eventual death of the tube. So really, this was a bit of a fruitless exercise, but I didn't understand what it was all about at the time. And the good news is that running at 95% power for 15 minutes didn't wreck my tube. Here's the power characteristic for my new tube. Now the red line is the drive current that we're putting into the tube and the blue line is in fact the output power in watts. And you can see the watts, of, the watts were climbing very steadily up to a, a programmed value of about 35% and all of a sudden they started to go haywire. The power dropped off and then it carried on going up again. Um, it looks a bit distressing. But then you remember, as we were working through, I did mention to you that we had this sort of um, schizophrenic character that popped out of the tube. It couldn't make up its mind whether it wanted to run or not run. After I'd completed the 95% checks, I decided I would go back and check what I would normally think would be 20 milliamps of running. And so I selected 65% power and repeated the test again only to get a completely different result. And I then decided to calibrate down towards zero. And as we calibrated down towards zero, we have the mauve line for the uh, input current and we have the green line for the output wattage. The green line is what I would have typically expected. The mauve line is typically what I would have expected. If we were to project the mauve line further we could drop it onto the red line and vice versa if we projected the green line further on it would probably drop onto the blue line. So we've got this strange area halfway up the calibration chart where the tube wants to go into this Jekyll and Hyde mode as I call it. Now I have noticed that after a period of running the blue line flips to the green line. Now whether that's something to do with the warming up of the tube and the gas, I can't say at the moment because I haven't done enough work. If I run the machine for a few seconds at 70% or 75% and then drop it back to 65%, I can flip from the blue line to the green line. Knowing that it is possible to switch it, there is a possible solution that could exist within RD Works. If we go to the program, one of the features that's built into the bottom of the program, which I never understood what it was until somebody pointed it out to me and then it was pretty damned obvious. We've got this little thing here called laser through mode. I understand that the purpose of that is um, for doing your initial pierce. So what I could do is I could put in here maybe 70 or 75% like that. So that the first thing I do is kick the machine into action with a 75% pulse for just, I haven't tried that, but it's something I'm going to have to experiment with. Well, I think to summarize what I have found out during this three part session, I have got a much clearer understanding now of how my laser tube works. I've got a much clearer understanding of how my laser tube dies. I've come away with some bigger questions than I started with. See you in the next session.